Well done. Good, uh, good reminder. I, uh, we were at Shepherds 360 a couple weeks ago, a, a conference, and the big thing now is stickers, right? Everyone, they used to they give out like little, all kinds of different knickknacks and things. Now they give out like stickers you put on your computer and stuff. And I got one from a missions agency that, that says, meet you at the throne. I like that. I like that, that idea, meet you, meet you at the throne. Um, but until we get there, we have work to do. Okay, and that's kind of where we are now is if you're, if you're visiting with us or newer, uh, we're taking a pause. We, we, we normally do verse-by-verse expositional preaching. That's our, our practice here. Um, starting in December, we'll be starting a series in the Gospel of Matthew um, as we lead up to, to Christmas and then the life of Christ after that. But we're taking November to do something a little special. We, we want to ask, what is the church? You know, we, we, we talked about in, um, in our song, you know, We Believe, in this time, of desolation, right? Like there's, there's, uh, it goes confusion all around us, and there's, there's chaos, and there's challenges, and there's struggles, and there's hurt, and there's people who are wrestling, and we have to know who we are and what our mission is if we're going to effectively meet the needs of the day, right? If we're effectively going to stand firm on truth while loving broken people and showing them who Jesus is, we first have to know who we are, okay? And so, we come this morning to this idea of what is church membership? And again, we, there are, it is far from my goal to make this some kind of dry theological lecture, right? We could do that, but I'll save that for Sunday night, right? If you want to, you know, I, I, um, actually, I'm doing biblical counseling Sunday night. So you can come and be bored by Chuck. No, I, I'm kidding. Um, don't, don't, no. Chuck is doing a phenomenal job unpacking um, a biblical theology of worship on Sunday night. So I encourage you to, to come back. It, it's a, like a four-part series. So um, come back and, and see that. But as we talk about what membership is, this, this behooves us all. So I want to go back to uh, my childhood, uh, Ronald Reagan, okay? So um, I, I barely remember Reagan. I'm, I was born in 81, so I was kind of a, you know, he grew up, you know, hearing his name a lot. In 1983, uh, President Reagan did something that was kind of like uh, sneaky cool, Okay. He was delivering a speech, right? Reagan is famous for his speeches, right? That he was, he was, a, he was a, um, a very effective people person when it came to, to politics. And he was talking to the, the National Association of Evangelicals back when the NAE was, was actually like theologically conservative, um, not so much today. But, but he was, was talking to a gathering of the NAE, and he did something that was fairly controversial, raised a little bit of hackles. He... he gave a, a speech. It was, it was actually not meant to be one of his keynote speeches. It was going to be a lower key affair. And he referred to the Soviet Union as the evil empire. Okay. Um, now, I know the evil empire as the New York Yankees. Okay. That's, that's I mean, growing up as an Orioles fan, there, are, there is the Orioles. Uh, you know, it's my two favorite baseball teams are the Orioles and whoever's playing the Yankees. Um, and that's kind of where, where I go. But, but Ronald Reagan did something that was really controversial but important. And by using that, he wasn't trying to dump mud on the Soviet Union, but what he was doing was clarifying something. Something that up until then, through detente with, with Carter and others before him, had not been really clearly laid out. And it was this. This country that we are in this Cold War with is fundamentally different than us. We live, we exist imperfectly, okay, imperfectly in this sphere of free countries, countries that have self-determination, that can choose their leaders. We just did it a couple weeks ago, and whether your candidate won, lost, or what have you, at whatever level you were looking for candidates to win, lose, you had a say in that process, okay? And what he was pointing out, and he went back over and over again to human rights and freedom of self-determination with, with the Soviet Union. He, well, he, what he was doing was drawing a line, is that there's us, and we're part of this defined group of nations that have this, and there's you, and you're not part of that defined group of nations. And for that, I will refer to you as an evil empire. And so there, there's sometimes, while, while we tend to draw too many lines, I think, we draw lines between Democrats and Republicans, and we draw lines between generations, you know, for some, something happens in school, you remember that friend you had who was one grade ahead of you, and you hung out together all through elementary school, through junior high, but then they went to high school, and you were still in junior high, and all of a sudden this invisible wall had grown up, because it's not cool for high schoolers to hang out with junior highers anymore, and you're like, but dude, like in one year, I'm going to be 
there, but then you're going to be a freshman, which is basically the equivalent of dirt. So, I mean, that's, that is what it is. And we draw these like weird lines, right? We draw these lines, well, these people don't hang out with these people, and you can't talk to these people, and you know, we don't, we don't do this, and no one hangs out with lawyers, because that's just, I mean, but sometimes lines are helpful. Sometimes lines mark who, who, who are our primary responsibilities to. My family has a line around it, right? I love every one of you, and I will care for your soul to the very best of my ability, but there's a special calling on me for those who share my last name, right? The same is true of you as well. We would die for each other, but there's a special relationship that exists within that family, okay? If two little kids come running down this aisle crying, and one of them is mine, and one of them is one of yours, I'm hoping that you're coming out of your aisle to get the one that's yours. I'll come down and get mine, right? Now, if no one's getting the other one, we'll, we'll take care of that too, but my priority is mine. And it helps in the church too to know who are ours and who do we still need to reach, who belongs here and who do we need to engage as someone who is outside, but someone who we hope will join the family. That's really what church membership is. I, I remember once pastoring in Indiana, and, and one of the things you do, I found this in Tunkhannock as well, is there's two things you always read in the local newspaper, okay? The obituaries and the police blotter, okay? Because unending entertainment from the obituaries and the police blotter, okay? Okay. Um, mainly from the police blotter, not so much entertainment from the obituaries. You're just glad your name's not in there. And so we, we were looking through, and there was an obituary for an older lady who had passed away in the community in Indiana, in which we were. It, the, the obituary read she had been a longtime member of Washington Baptist Church. The problem with that was I was the pastor of Washington Baptist Church. I had never met her, never heard of her, and looking back in our records, had no record of her ever being a member of the church. Um, no one I talked to knew who she was. You know, it, it was kind of an interesting, interesting little thing. Um, and I'm, what I'm guessing is she probably like brought her kids to VBS one time. It was like that's my church, and that's that's kind of how sometimes these things happen. And so when we ask the question, though, why is that important? Why is it important that membership? Wh- why do we even need to talk about this? Number one, I think because it's biblical, and number two, because it, it, it marks that group of who's here and who we need to say, hey. Will you come join us? Because it's open to all who are believers, right? This isn't some exclusive club. It's, it's, there's specific requirements for it. And so let's dive into our notes here. If you didn't get your notes, there's some on the back. Um, but here's, here's where we're going. Big idea. If you are a Christian, that's a big if. If you're not a Christian, we're really glad you're here. We want to share with you Jesus, right? That's, that's, that's not to push someone out the door. We want non-Christians to walk through that door and find out what Christ is all about from you, okay? So, but, but, but that's not who membership is for, right? Membership is for those who have put their faith and trust, trust in Christ. So if you're a Christian, you should be a faithful member of a local Bible-believing church. Why? We're going to answer why, okay? And we're going to do it with a lot of Bible, okay? So get your Bible fingers ready. Actually, all the references are in your notes, so just get your pen ready as we go. Number one, membership marks the boundaries of the church. Why is this important? Membership marks the boundaries of the church. And there's three areas that are important. First of all, we're, like we did last week, we're going to get the negative one out of the way first. It's first of all, it marks the boundaries for discipline, right? We, Matthew 18, I'm not going to turn there. I put it up on the screen. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. How many of us have been there, right? So-and-so is doing something they're not supposed to be doing. We go to them. We're like, hey, you shouldn't be, um, you know, I don't know, throwing frozen rotten eggs at the church at night. It's a really bad thing. It makes it look, you know, because you disagree with the color of the carpet. Don't do that anymore. And if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, you tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. See, church discipline, which is something that too many churches are not practicing, can only be applied to those who have submitted themselves to the authority of the local church. Like, we can't, we, the, the, when, when Jesus says, take it to the church, he's speaking of a defined boundary of people. It's not just whoever showed up that Sunday morning. Because that could be Joe Schmo from the bar down the street who just walked in. It's like, oh, I got some juicy gossip from Community Bible Church. They're having an issue with a guy throwing rotten eggs at the building, and he's been confronted about it, and he won't stop. Apparently, he's got an egg problem. 
And so discipline marks the boundaries. It marks who we're to tell it to. Every now and then, something will come up where there's an issue with someone who's, who's a non-member, and it's, it's a perpetual sin issue, right? Someone's doing something over here or doing something over here, and, and the, there's very little we can do. The, you, can't, you can confront the sin personally, but we can't bring that to the church. They haven't submitted to the authority of the church. In fact, we create legal jeopardy for ourselves by announcing to a group of gathered Christians, this person's doing this over on the, the side. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, Paul, Paul makes it clear here. He's, this, is, this, is, this is like some pretty blatant immoralities. He said, it's actually reported that there's a sexual immorality among you. Talking of the church, church at Corinth, right? They're trying to be tolerant. They're trying to be like, you know, modern, new age, 2,000 years ago. And for of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. For, for those who, who, who want clear English, a guy is sleeping with his father's wife, whether it's his stepmother and you are arrogant. Why are they arrogant? Because they're holding this up as a badge of our tolerance and inclusivity. That we're allowing this in, our, in the midst of our church and we're okay. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. But who's among you? In other words, even though the word church membership is not there, there's a defined boundary of who is in and who is out. Because what Paul isn't saying is don't let the guy show up for worship anymore. We want broken people to come to church. We want sinful people to come to church. We want lost people to come to church. That's not what he's addressing. He's addressing, put him outside the circle of those who are defined as the local church. He's put out of what we would refer to as membership. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and, as if, and, and, if, and as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. Now, Paul follows up on this guy. You're like, I, you ever wonder what happened to these guys? Like, what happened to this guy? Well, Paul actually follows up in his second letter to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 9. He says this, Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, okay, speaking of, of this guy again, I believe, um, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by, ma- by the majority is enough, so you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So, so our understanding from here is that this guy, after being thrown out, has repented of this relationship, and now Paul's like, now what do you do now? Well, you don't continue to pile on. That's not the purpose of church discipline. The purpose of discipline is restoration, right? It's fellowship. We want you back, but what you're doing right now forces us to put you outside of this circle. And so he's like, don't pile on. You need to have forgiveness, and I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For that is why I wrote that it might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. So discipline kind of draws this circle around the membership of the church. Practically speaking, membership defines, it's, it's for decisions, right? Who makes the decision? See, we, are a, we, are a, we believe in congregational polity, right? So we have elders who kind of make some of the decisions, but the ultimate authority in the local church underneath Jesus Christ is the congregation. That's you. So we have a, you know, if we have a business meeting, we need to vote on something, do we just, is it just every Tom, Dick, and Harry who walk through the door? No, you can't do that. There, there's a defined group there who make the decisions in the local church, and that's the membership. But also for leadership. So I'm a pastor and an elder, and I care deeply that I do my job well. Um, this, I stepped out of pastoral ministry for a couple years, loved working in the IT world. I worked nine to five, and I never got a call after hours. I love it. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> consistent work hours. Like, no one was, was just breaking down, telling me their, their life history and why they don't want to change. It's all someone else's fault. It's not theirs. Um, and, uh, and yet, um, there, there's, there's a calling that, that you, you have to answer to. And, but I want to know who I'm going to give an answer for. So in Hebrews 13, 17, uh, the author of Hebrews says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. As those who have to give an account, let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, we, we oftentimes bring this text up, speaking of how should the church respond to their elders. Is There needs to be a, a spiritually submissive relationship there. But I look at this also as, who am I going to answer for? Like, I get to stand before God one day and be like, how did you shepherd Kent? How did you shepherd Sean? How did you shepherd fill in the fill in the blank. That's a little concerning, right? Like, like I, I'm accountable to you guys as a church, but that, that doesn't concern me nearly as much as answering to Jesus one day for all of you. But what membership does is defines that group. 
here's who. I'm not going to give an account for Grace Fellowship. That's their problem, all right? I give an account for you. So membership marks the boundaries of the church, but here's where I, I want to kind of part for a few minutes. Membership defines duties within the church. We talked about some of these last week, but I want to hit them again because I think these are really important. Is the more I look around at our society, the more I see churches that are designed around passive observance rather than active participation. The people are missing this. Churches are getting this wrong. They're, they're feeding the consumer-driven nature of our culture. So the, and, and, but those are the churches that are getting really big, right? Because you walk through the door, no one asks anything of you, no one expects anything from you, and if you don't show up for four weeks, no one's calling you and saying, hey, we missed you at church on Sunday. Where have you been? Okay? Well, I definitely wasn't, you know, fill in the blank with your excuse for why you weren't, why you weren't there. We have, we, have, we have a job to do, and we do a lot of this really well. It's one of the things I love about this church is this church cares well, but we need to keep going. Like, we need to keep growing. Because, as I've said many, many times, and I'll say it till I die or you fire me, is Tonkanic is not going to get less broken. Like, there's, the needs are only going to get more and more significant there. And so we need to do this well here so that we can go out there and do it just as well. Okay? All right, so here we go. Duties within the church. First of all, love. Jesus made this really clear. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By, all, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You notice he didn't say, maybe it's in the Message Bible, if you have the message, check my translation. He didn't say, all people will know that you are my disciples if you voted for Donald Trump. Okay, now I get it, I get it. We're touching, touching a little bit. I voted for the guy. Okay, I get it, I get it, but, but I'm not real proud of it. Um, just the other, the alternative was, was pretty, pretty terrible too. So it is what it is. Here's where we are. No, we are marked by our love for each other. We've all heard of that church where there is no love. It's a loveless church. It's, it's the fighting and the schism and the bickering and the splits over the color of the carpet. Like I've heard churches fighting over whether they were going to have chairs or pews. You're like, really? This is what we're going to fight over? I mean, we're going to like, this is really bad. It doesn't mean we don't have really good discussions about things, but let's, let's, let's minimize the chair versus pew battle, all right? Let's, 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 let's keep, save it for, like, really important stuff, like whether we sing old hymns or new contemporary songs. I mean, that's, that's a really important battle for us to fight over. No, we are to be marked by love. Do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you love the church? When you're away from this place for a week, now, we, we, when we're away, we try to visit other churches. And, um, a couple years ago, we got to be down, we were down in Florida, and we, we were on our way back, so we stopped at um, First Baptist Jacksonville, where Heath Lambert is the pastor, and it was, it's a larger church, and it was nice, like, it was cool, he's a good, it was a good church, it was neat stuff, but, but it's not your home, like, it's some, there's something different, like, you're like, I want to get home, <laughs> like, I want to get back to my people, you know, there's a love for each other. Uh, secondly, membership, our duties, peace and unity, we're to seek peace and unity with each other. Uh, Romans 12, 16, we, we mentioned this verse last week. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. See, there's a lot of broken people that walk through our doors, and those would, many of those are what our society would call the lowly, right? They're struggling. They might be single parents. They might have some real baggage they're carrying with in the past. It might be a kid who just came from like a completely messed up home situation. And, and our concern is not then to like turn the back on those people, but to pour out association, kindness, care for those people. Push them toward Jesus Christ. Romans 14, 19. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do you ever, you ever before you come to church on Sunday morning, think, how can I build up someone else this morning? How can I push someone else toward Jesus this morning? That's a really good, really good thing to have in mind. Letter C, walk with each other. Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Sometimes we feel like one more than the other, don't we? Sometimes because our hearts, our own hearts are breaking, it's easier for us to, to weep with those who are weeping. But then you find out that that couple who have been trying for 10 years to get pregnant are expecting. And, and you're called in the middle of your brokenness and your weeping to rejoice with someone who's rejoicing. And your emotions are going, right? We've all been there. It's just your emotions are going crazy. And yet we are called to do both because we are called to walk with each other. So in the middle of our grief, we rejoice with those who are rejoicing. In the middle of our rejoicing, we weep with those who weep. Care for each other. Romans 12, 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Generally, care 
for each other. We, uh, first, sorry, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Again, now considering the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so also you to do on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up that he may, as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. Paul's instructing this, this gathering of funds to meet the needs of other believers, caring for each other. Galatians 6.10 so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Okay, so there's the broader circle. There's Tunkinic, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. There's a special relationship here, right? Special relationship here. Do good to everyone, especially those who are of the household of faith. Uh, James 1.27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We are to actively care for each other. Also, we're to provide accountability to each other. This can be hard, right? Because the biggest sinner you know looks back at you in the mirror every morning. Okay, you look in the mirror and you're like, okay. But do you care enough for someone else to be like, hey, I'm seeing this going on in your life and I want to walk alongside you? Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brothers, anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual. Okay, these are not super Christians. All right, I would argue that someone who is spiritual is a born-again Christian who is simply walking in the Spirit. Okay? In other words, they're not wrapped up in their own deceitful sin. In other words, let's say you got two guys who are dealing with alcohol issues. Two guys who are dealing with alcohol issues who are themselves given over to the alcohol issues are not usually the best helpers for each other because they're both given over to the same temptation. Okay? They're, they're having the same issue. They need help from, from a different sphere, if you would. Okay? If you, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Some people miss the gentleness part. They think this, instead of a book, this is like a weapon. And I'm going to beat you know, beat people over it, over the head with it. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Paul's making a really important point here. Is that church isn't always supposed to be roses and, you know, daisies, right? Church, sometimes church is messy because you got someone who's in mud and, and, and you're called not to just walk by, not to be like, oh, they need professional help. They, they may need professional help. They may need your help. They may simply need someone to get down in the mud with them and be like, hey, listen, I know we're both, we're both here, but I'm going to hold your hand and we're going to walk toward Jesus together. We're going to walk toward Jesus together. I'm not going to let go until we're there. Okay? This is really important. We're to care for each other, keep each other accountable. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. But also... Letter F, we're to edify each other. So this was like a catchphrase when I was in youth group. We would all say things like, edify, stupid, okay, because we were dumb, like, and that's dumb. Um, but but we, so there's a specific way in which we are to build each other up, right? First Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So Paul's like, you're doing it, but you need to be encouraged because guess what? You're going to get tired. You're going to get worn out. It's going to get hard. There's going to be days where you don't feel like it. You had a hard day. The last thing you want to do is build someone else up. Paul's like, do it anyway. 1 Peter 4.10, one of the verses that Kenny read, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. I, I, I implore you, if you are here and you are a member or that's something you are heading towards, do not be a Sunday morning only Christian. You, there are people here who need what you bring to the table. That is not a guilt trip. That is me imploring you to use the ways that God has gifted you to minister well to other people. And the best way to find those people is by just being around. Come to whatever you can come to, whatever fits into your schedule. I know work schedules are crazy. You're P&G, you're like here, 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 over here, all over the place. Or you got one of those other weird schedules. But, but fit within whatever you can do. Be at what you can be at and push into the body. Find people that you can engage with at the level that you are able to do it. Bear with one another. We talked about this a little bit last week, but I, I want to remind us of these. Um, this, is, this is basically putting up with each other. This is, I don't get mad and take my ball and go home very easily. Now, if we start introducing heresy, you have, you have my permission to, to leave, okay? But short of that, let's have a conversation, okay? Um, Romans 15.1, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. In other words, there's going to be strong Christians and weak Christians, and we, we, are, to, we are to bear with each other. 
We're, we're to work, work through those things. Colossians 3, 12 and 13. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Pray for each other. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Protect each other. This can be hard. There's a lot coming at us from the world, right? There's a lot of temptation to compromise. There's a lot of bad theology out there. I mean, it's like you can, you can go to christianbook.com, right? And you can find really good, absolute heresy, mediocre, eh, okay, good. Like, it's, it's all mixed into one bag, right? And you're like, someone's coming in like, I found this great new thing. It's like, Jesus and Satan used to be brothers. Like, Okay, um, we need to talk about that. That's, that's actually not new. Um, it's been around for a while, and it's, it's heresy, okay? <laughs> let's, let's have a conversation. But, but we need to look out for each other, right? Romans 16, 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions. In other words, Paul's like, listen, there's going to be people who are going to come in. Unfortunately, today, they don't actually have to walk through the door. They can do it online, through the radio, all right? The big thing now is, is we've got ministry after ministry drifting toward compromising on gender and sexuality issues, right? So you think about, you know, things like Crew and, and, and um, well, all the ministries associated with Crew. I won't name all of them because one of them has a prominent radio station. And there's some, some like, drifting, drifting toward this, this openness and, and inclusion kind of idea. And it's like, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. In other words, the goal here is not unity for the sake of unity. The goal is unity around the doctrine you have been taught taught. Avoid them. Verse 76, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. I think of this oftentimes as, you ever seen like the maverick YouTube guy? Like I'm not saying a specific person, I'm saying in general. There's like the guy on YouTube who has come up with a new, it's like the Bible code. When I was a kid, it was the Bible code, right? If you read the second word in the fourth book on the fifth page in the third letter of the fifth King James edition from 1611 to 18, 1689, it predicts that the world's going to end in 2024. It does. It's absolute, rock solid. Just watch my, my complicated methodology here to figure out how this works. And you're like, that, that's kind of what I'm, like, what I'm thinking of with this, right? Is, is you have these people who are, they're using Bible words, but they're contradicting Bible doctrine, and it's basically a me thing. He, is an unhealthy, he has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. There's a lot of those running around out there, too, that we need to watch out for. Titus 3.10. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. That's pretty significant. Like, Paul's putting division up there with, like, like immorality, like lying, stealing. He's like, don't, don't, don't do it. 2 John 10.11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, he's, he's speaking of orthodox, you know, biblical teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. That's, that's kind of sobering. That's like, dude, we're supposed to be nice to everyone except this person. Like, I want to, you know, that's, that's kind of a complicated thing. So we're to protect each other. It, I, I always have to throw this one in because it, it, you know, care for your pastor, all right? Take care, take care of your pastor. He's, he's an important guy too. Um, I, I'm, I'm kidding. It's just, but, it, but it's here. So, all right, First Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching, right? Church, good, you know, it's one of the duties toward each other. But so when, when we say that, that our church takes care of our pastor and his family, we're defining our church as, as our membership, right? The people who are, who are there, right? That's who we look to. Um, use your gifts. Use your gifts. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here, but but the text that, that Kenny read and, and the text in Romans 12 here, um, and, and by gifts I don't mean let your phone ring in the in the service. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Romans, Romans Romans 12. He, Paul says this. He says, "For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you." not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Because that's a natural tendency, right? Our society is very much self, self, um, 
It's not inflammatory, inflatatory. We'll just put it that way. I made up a new word. It's basically, is you get puffed up. You are special. You are number one. You are awesome. We give out trophies for everyone, all right? And, it's like, and Paul's like, no, no, don't think of yourself more than how you know, think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. We can't all do the same thing. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. Use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Don't don't miss that last one. We need a lot of cheerful mercy givers in our churches. We need a lot of people who go looking for the broken and say, guess what? I'm broken too, but I found hope. Here's hope. That's, that's a, a, an ultimate act of mercy to those who are suffering. Use your gifts. In 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, part of the text that Kenny read, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. The purpose of us using our gifts with each other is not so that someone will get up here and sing a solo and we all go, oh my word, he, she, or whatever is amazing. No. It's that someone will walk through that door, sit in these chairs, and say, whoever this God is that these people claim to serve, he must be worthy of praise. Because it takes a lot to stand up there. Okay? It's the same with how we care for each other. People staying after church and talking to each other. People ministering well. People praying over each other. The purpose of all of it is that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Okay? So, number one, Membership marks the boundaries of the church. Number two, membership defines duties within the church. Number three, membership marks a common devotion. We oftentimes teach our, uh, our kids that friendship are two people in the same boat going in the same direction, right? The second that people are going in a different direction, they can't stay in the same boat, right? Because eventually you run out of boat. Unless it's a really, really big boat, then the analogy breaks down. Um, but so you, there has to be, to some degree, a going in the same direction. The same thing is true of us as a church. There are certain things that mark us, and here's our devotion. First of all, we have a common devotion to Christ. John 8, 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So one of the things that marks, that we want to mark the membership of CBC is a devotion to Christ. Jesus above all else. Jesus above me, Jesus above the elders, Jesus above the congregation, Jesus above all. He is worthy of our devotion. This is how the world is going to know that, that we are his disciples, that we abide in his word, we show love for each other. Secondly, devotion to scripture, Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching is what we have contained in our scriptures. And the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So we are marked by the word of God. Even when we do topical messages like this, we never want to stand up here and be like, I don't want to stand up and be like, seven tips to a happier marriage, and then I come across as like the marriage guru. Number one, I'm not. You can just ask my wife. Um, number two is that puts the ultimate authority for marriage with the person speaking, not with where it should be, which is right here. We go back to this. Always, everything, this. CBC kids, their authority, here. Youth group, when they meet tonight, here. Sunday school classes, here. This is our devotion. Our devotion is to the text. We, we laugh in, in our biblical counseling class sometimes about how often similar themes pop up in different meetings that we have, right? Well, you would assume that's going to be the case if we're all going back to the same original document, right? Original source of authority, okay? Um, also, sorry, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. In other words, Peter's like, if you've tasted the Lord is good, it's gonna, there's going to be an appetite created in you that you long for spiritual milk because once you've had it, you want more and you want to grow. Are you growing? Devotion to one another. So we have devotion to Christ, devotion to Scripture. We already talked about a lot of the one and others. I'm just going to read one text here, Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, 
any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. We must be devoted to one another. We talked about these last week, but devotion to the ordinances. Devotion to Lord's Supper and baptism as our two practices of public demonstrations of faith. And then devotion to prayer. Paul made it really clear, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it's like three words, pray without ceasing. We're to be devoted to these things. So, natural question, how does one join Community Bible Church? I'm glad you asked. We're going to cover that as we close. So our final point here is how does one join Community Bible Church? And there's some really important steps, right? It's open to Anyone meeting some qualifications? So let's talk about those qualifications. Number one, you have to be a Christian. Okay, that's a really important step. That's the important step. In fact, if you're here and you're a Christian and we're not really your cup of tea, that's okay, as long as you're a Christian. That's the big, that's the big thing. If you're here and you don't know if you're a Christian, you're unsure, or you're like, I'm not a Christian, I'm just checking this thing out, then we want to introduce you to Christ. Okay? Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is, this, is, this is our first bar, right? You must be in Christ. Have you come to the point where you have said, I am a sinner, okay? A sinner, you guys, my nine-year-old, he'll tell you a sinner is anything we, we, anything we think, say, or do that violates God's law, okay? You are a sinner. You have broken God's commands. You can do nothing to save yourself. You can't clean it up. You can't do a bunch of good things. You can't join the church. You can't even give a bunch of money, although we'll take it. We got a lot of projects around here we want to we work on, but that won't save you. Don't confuse the two. Okay, Being generous and being saved are not the same thing. You've come to the point where nothing I can do can, can redeem me. And the consequence of my sin is eternal separation apart from God in a place called hell. Why? Because God is, is a nasty person? No, because I'm an awful rebel. I'm a terrible sinner. But God, in his great love for us, John 3, 16, sent his only begotten son to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, to be raised on the third day, to pay for that sin. So if you put your faith and trust in God through Christ, you are saved. Okay? You have questions about that? Man, there's, there's a whole room of people here who would be like, me, I'll talk to you. I'd love to talk to you. Okay? Hopefully they would. If not, they should be completely ashamed of themselves. But that's, I'm just tongue-in-cheek. So are you a Christian? That's step one. Number two, are you walking in faithfulness? What we mean by that is, is, are you walking consistent with the gospel? I don't mean are you perfect. We're not looking for perfect people. Otherwise, our membership role would be zero. I save a lot of computer space on my hard drive as I try to you know, add names and take away names who move away and things like that. But are you walking in general faithfulness? Um, thirdly, are you in agreement with our constitution and statement of faith? See, we're not the same. There's different churches, right? And part of that is because we're broken human people, but part of that is because we have looked at the same Bible and come to different conclusions. We're not Presbyterians. And there's some pretty big, we don't baptize babies. We believe in believer's baptism. That's a pretty big distinction. If you're, if you're into that camp, there's some good evangelical Presbyterian, Presbyterian churches you can align yourself with. Um, but if you, if you want to find out what we believe, I put some copies of our Constitution and Statement of Faith on the back table back there. So right over Jackie's head, Right in the back, Bill can show you where they are after the service today. If you want to grab a copy of that, if we run out, I will happily print more. That tells you who we are and what we believe. And I think one of the, one of the, 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 the jewels of this church that never gets talked about is that Dave Stuckey wrote that constitution and that statement of faith, and he did a phenomenal job with it. And one of the, one of the most phenomenal things, I've told the elders this like five times, one of the most phenomenal things he did is he differentiated what we believe between those things you must believe in order to be a member of our church and those things which cannot be challenged. In other words, here's the things you have to believe. Here's the things that we're going to teach. You may disagree with them and still be a member. That's okay. But they are not to be challenged in our, in our classes, right? So there's, there's certain, you know, I, I, you can look at our, our documentation. And so the other thing is be in agreement with our philosophy of ministry. If you're like, you know what? I'm really not looking for this whole Bible stuff. Like, I'm really looking for more like a seeker-sensitive thing, like where it's kind of like Bible light. They don't really, because I'm just really not into the whole Bible thing. This probably isn't the church for you. You're going to be frustrated. 
and you're going to be aggravated. You're going to get irritated. <laughs> if you're like, I don't really want to reach out to the community. I just want to be one of the frozen chosen, just kind of sitting in here. You know, I want to sing standing on the promises, but I really just want to be sitting on the premises. Um, <laughs> probably not the church for you either, okay? We, we intend to go deep into the Word of God and passionately engage our community with the power of the gospel, okay? So those two things. Fourthly, I, I challenge you to write out your salvation story. This plays in the next step. But, but see, here's what happens. Sometimes I sit across from someone, I'm like, how did you come to faith in Jesus Christ? And they're like, uh, and I've heard them before clearly state the gospel, but for some reason, people think that when the pastor asks you a question, that's supposed to be like really intimidating. Ask my kids. I'm like the least intimidating person on the face of the planet. My kids are not intimidated by me at all. I tell my five-year-old, stop doing that. She just keeps, she just keeps on going, right? And it's like, this is great. I, I can't, like, how am I supposed to lead a church? I can't even get my five-year-old. No, I, I'm, I'm kidding. We deal with that appropriately, swiftly, and severely. Um, and then we go from there. But I want to encourage you, write out your salvation testimony. How did you come to faith in Jesus Christ? It doesn't have to be long. You can fit it on a three-by-five card, okay? Next, attend a membership class. This is not a biblical requirement. This is a requirement that we put out because we want to know that you're in alignment with us. We want to hear your salvation story. We want to know that you agree with us and that, that, you, that we agree with you, okay? Because that's, you know, not everyone agrees with everyone. So if you're interested in that, right next to the constitutions in the back, there's actually an interest list. If you're like, hey, I've been attending here for like this long. I'm not a member, but I'd like to be one. I think based on what you said this morning, this is a good fit for me. Put your name on that list. I'll be in touch. We'll figure out what that looks like. Okay, next step. You get to interview with Pastor Brian. See, um, quote, a few minutes ago about me not being an intimidating person. This is you and I just sitting down and talking through your salvation story. You know, who were you? What happened? Who are you now? Okay, and why do you want to be part of this church? Why not this church down the road or this church over here or this online church that asks nothing of you, okay? Why, why do you want to be here? And then this is the intimidating part because our elders are scary, like, is you meet with the elders, right? And, and they, they, they bring the knives, right? Like, there's some brass knuckles in that meeting. No, I'm kidding. I'm completely kidding. Our, our, like, our elders are like sheepdogs. They're, they're, they're sweet and tender until you compromise on the gospel, and then they, they'll rip your throat out. Okay, and that's, so that's, that's who our elders are. But you sit down with the elders, and basically you just share the same thing you shared with me. Okay, and then they, they decide, am I going to recommend you to the church? And you get recommended to the church, the church votes you in, and then you get you know, the right hand of fellowship, and boom, you're a member of Community Bible Church. Okay, simple process, right? No? Yeah. All right, guys, what do, we, what do we take home from this? <clears throat> First of all, if you are a believer and you regularly attend CBC, I strongly encourage you to move towards membership. Okay? Baptism is part of that too, but that's not something I wanted to put in the slides. That comes up in our, in our conversations there because it's, it's an it's a attached conversation. If, if you're like, I like this church, but I'm not really sure I want to be a member of it, I'm going to strongly encourage you. Like, listen, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not like, I don't have a big enough ego to think that we're the only good church out there. You need to find one that you can join because you need to put yourself under the authority of that, of those, of that leadership right? You need, whether it's us or Grace Fellowship or Mahoopany, like you need to be somewhere where you're like, I'm comfortable with those leaders. Like I, I'm, I'm willing to spiritually submit myself to their, to their leadership. And there, there's some great guys out there. Nick out at, at Mahoopany is a really solid guy. Um, the, the guys over at, at Grace are good guys. Like, like find someone that you can do that with. If you are a member, know that we are active participants, not passive consumers. We got to fight this. Like you need to help me. I need to help you. Because our culture is kind of like, like the old BK, you know, Burger King, have it your way, right? It's just, it's just so much, it's like, it's like the air we breathe anymore. That this, is, no, this is supposed to be how I want it, I'm supposed to come, I'm supposed to get my love tank filled by whatever's happening at church, and then I just go away like, like eating lollipops for the next week until I come back. And say, no, no, like you are called to minister to each other. We are called to engage with each other and care for each other and get in the mud with each other, lovingly push each other toward Jesus. So work hard to build and strengthen our church, seeking always to advance the mission of Christ through his church, right? Remember, when we go out to the community, we're ambassadors of Christ, but we also wear the CBC t-shirt, right? Now, we don't have any literal CBC t-shirts. I think we should at some point. I think that'd be kind of cool. But like, like that, we're, you're associated with this, with this place. Is your devotion to Christ waning? You ever find that? I think we've all been there, right? There's been seasons of our life where, where devotion to Christ is, is, we're struggling with that. 
There's no biblical category for someone who claims to love Christ but not his church. Push into your spiritual growth and pray that God will reignite your love for his bride. In fact, we have a Sunday school class specifically dedicated to basic discipleship, basic spiritual growth. We're going real slow, intentionally, so that anyone can just come in and begin to learn how to walk with Jesus. If you want more about information about that, just show up at 930. We'll get you in the right, in the right room. I love this church. We, we've been here for a little over a year, and I believe that God is at work in Tunkhannock through Community Bible Church. I left a, a very um, job I loved <laughs> to step back into a world that can sometimes be very uncertain because all it takes is one church split. And as a pastor, you're looking like we'd be looking for housing, salary. Like you, like you just, you don't, you don't think about it until you're there, right? But there's something here that's really important. There's something valuable here. Don't lose that. Push into this body. Look at your life. Evaluate your calendar. Look at your, your day timer. I, I still go do old paper, like day timer. Look at, look at your schedule. Be like, where can I push into our church family a little bit more? Whatever that looks like. There's different stuff and different things. And then let's together go before the throne of grace and then take that grace there because they need it. They desperately need to know what's happening here. All right, let's pray together. Father, You've been good to this body. You've been good to this church. You have put together a body of believers who care well for each other. When, when, when I see people talking and gathering together after services or after Bible studies or in the evening when stuff's going on, Lord, there, there's a tangible care for other Christians. When visitors come, I, I've never seen one not greeted. We, we, we love to see new people. We love to meet them and find out where they are and why they're here and what's going on in their lives. And Lord, now I ask that you would build your church. Lord, that we would actively engage with the broken, the hurting, and the lost, showing them Jesus Christ. Lord, would you build your church through membership, Lord, as we see people come in. Maybe people have, have attended for years and are like, you know what, it's time. It's time for me to commit. It's time for me to put myself under the authority of the local church as, as, as a participant in this body. And Lord, I pray that through that we would see your name glorified. Lord, then I pray that you would give us unity. Because, Lord, when, when we have business meetings where there's more voices, Lord, that can, that can lead in sometimes to disunity. And yet you have called us to have good conversations and then emerge unified. So, Lord, I pray that would be true of every meeting we ever have in this church. Lord, I pray then we would be passionately of one mind in engaging the lost. Lord, whether it's our, our, our soccer camp over the summer, VBS over the summer, our CBC Kids group in the evening, just inviting someone to Sunday school, CareNet, the, the ministry that many of our ladies help with um, in town, Lord, just meeting, hurting people where they are, Lord, showing them the love of Christ, Lord, I pray that souls would be saved through our biblical counseling ministry. Lord, hurting people would find help and hope through the power of your word. There's no magic sauce. We're not selling an elixir. We're not selling holy water. We're not selling anything. We are offering people the hope of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us never to lose that passion and that desire. Help us never to lose our desire to see your name glorified in this town, in this place, in this church, through individual lives, radically changed by the power of the gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray.